Good afternoon. My name is Sarah Drexler, and I'm a senior sales consultant with Goodwin House at Home. We are absolutely thrilled to bring you this program uh, today, and we have a wonderful group of speakers that will be sharing their expertise. Um, so we hope you enjoy the information that will be presented. Um, we do have a few housekeeping, item, housekeeping items that we would like to cover um, before we start our presentations. So the first one is um, you will see uh, full screen views of our slides and uh, it will be the presenter's, sli presenter's slides as well as uh, pictures, um, video pictures of the presenters. So just as you're seeing now, um, I want to introduce Beth Robinson, who will be uh, a moderator as well. Beth is our director of our member services facilitator. So we'll be walking you through this present, these presentations together. We do have a plan and time built in for a very uh, quick uh, Q&A session. We anticipate eight to 10 minutes for question and answer. If you're interested in submitting a question, uh, there is a section um, on the left, on the right hand side of your screen with go to meeting where you can click on the question mark and it will open up a chat box and you can submit your questions uh, that way. On the next slide, I think we have a better visual as to what, um, how that actually works. So you'll see on the right hand side of your screen, there's a question box and you simply click that, click that question box and then the the chat screen will come up so you can submit your questions. We will again review this um, at the end of at the end of our presentations. On the next slide, we're going to go through just a very quick overview of what we have um, in store for you today. So, uh, our first speaker is Kimberly Fisk. Um, Kimberly is a uh, attorney, a partner with Fisk Law Group in Alexandria, and she's going to cover estate planning as well as trusts. Next, we have Mark Williams, who's a consultant with Lansdale Group, and he's going to be providing information about organizing all of those important documents and keeping them safe online. And finally, we're going to have a presentation from Seal Garrett. SEAL is the executive director of At Home in Alexandria, as well as a board officer of the Washington Area Village Exchange, which is a, a large group of area villages within the Washington metro area. And then, of course, as I mentioned, we will have time at the end of the presentation for questions and answers. Uh, at this time, you, we realize that many of you may not be familiar with what Goodwin House at Home is and what kind of support and services are provided by Goodwin House at Home. So I thought um, we thought it would be good to do just a very quick overview of this program. So Goodwin House at Home is uh, a membership-based program designed for older adults who really would like to remain in the home that they love as they age. This program has many benefits um, available to its members, but in the interest of time, we thought it made sense just to focus on probably what we consider the three most important components of Goodwin House at Home. The first one is that this program offers comprehensive built-in care coordination and care management services for our members. Um, we have four member services facilitators currently, each of our member services facilitators are, uh, have an educational background in social work and have at least a master's degree in social work, social work. We actually have one member services facilitator who actually is the director, that's Beth Robinson, who is a licensed clinical social worker. So these professionals, their role really is to get to know our members when they're well, help them develop a plan based on their wishes and, and how they would like their future to unfold, and then they will execute that plan for our members when they start needing help and support. So it really provides uh, the feeling that our members are never alone. They have someone that's going to step in and ensure they have everything they need as their needs change. The second component will act a lot like traditional long-term care insurance in that Goodwin House at Home pays for care. We have five flexible financial plans uh, available with this program. Each of our plans have a daily benefit, which is a dollar amount that we pay for care, and then a lifetime maximum. 
And finally, Goodwin House at Home, also we guarantee access to quality care, which will be increasingly important as people continue to live longer because with advancements in uh, technology as well as medical care. And with the baby boomers who are coming up through the system, um, they're aging into the system at a rate of 10,000 baby boomers are turning 65 every day. And that's anticipated to continue until 2029. So you can imagine at that rate that the caregiving universe is going to be stretched very thin. And um, that's why it's very important that um, people have access to, to quality care. So that's a very brief summary of Goodwin House at Home. And if you are interested in learning more, uh, we will have contact information at the end of our presentations. And we would love the opportunity to talk with you about the program. So at this time, I'm going to turn um, the uh, presentations over to Beth Robinson. And as I mentioned, Beth Robinson is the Director of Member Services Facilitators for Goodwin House at Home. She's been with the organization and the larger Goodwin House organization for many, many years and is, um, is a wonderful person as well. So Beth, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you for that wonderful introduction, Sarah. Um, first, we will hear from Kim Fisk. Uh, Kim has been working in the estate planning field since 1990, first with the SunTrust Bank Trust Department, then with St. Jude Children's Research Hospital, and now as partner at Fisk Law Group in Alexandria. She taught income taxation as an adjunct professor at George Mason University and in Scalia Law School, and now frequently lectures on estate planning issues. Active in the community, Kim currently serves on the board on the Goodwin House Foundation Board. Kim? Thank you very much, Beth. I appreciate that. It's great to be here with all of you. I wish I could see you, and I wish we could have a, a two-way communication, but it's nice to be here. I'm glad we can do this much right now during the pandemic. So we're going to talk about estate planning, and let's get some jargon down. What exactly is an estate? My clients ask me that a lot. Sometimes they say, I don't have enough to plan, but that's not true. Your estate includes everything that you own, and that includes bank accounts, your real estate, um, all sorts of things. It includes things without a title, and that would be your jewelry, your artwork, your couches. Sometimes those are the things that are in biggest contention when you pass away because of the emotional value. Um, and finally, your estate also includes digital assets, your Facebook, your iTunes account, and even your emails. And so it's important to plan what you want to have happen to all of those assets upon your death. Um, why should you plan? Because if you don't state who is going to receive these assets, then your state has a plan for you. And so proper planning during your lifetime can make sure that you are in control. And I know we all want to be in control. So you can control who carries out your wishes and who receives your assets. Um, even though, the, even though the state has a plan for you, sometimes strange things happen. And that, let me tell you a story about that. About two years ago, I received a call from Sharon who lived in New York. She was in her mid eighties. And she said, Kim, my brother Peter just died and I am his closest relative. And I'm, I'm going to be the sole beneficiary and I'm going to settle his estate, but I don't want to go to Virginia. Would you please serve as the executor and qualify? So I said, sure, that's great, I'll do that. And so I went along settling the estate and about six months later, I start getting phone calls and letters from other people who've come forward and said, you know what? I am the beneficiary of Peter's estate. That was really interesting. So I asked Sharon if she knew these people and she knew a few of them, but she didn't know all of them. 22 people came forward. It turns out that there's a research company that will go to courthouses and review estates that pass without a will in testacy. And that's how Peter's estate was. He did not have a will. And they look and see who the actual heirs are. So they did a web, an internet search, and they couldn't find Sharon's relation to Peter. Sharon said that her mother married Peter's father. And once they got married, Peter's father adopted her in the 1940s in New York. So I said, Sharon, you've got to show me those adoption papers. 
So she started looking and she was unable to find the adoption papers in New York. Apparently their records are handwritten and sometimes from that time and sometimes they're misfiled. So I had to actually file a petition with the court and ask the court to determine who the heirs are. We had a trial on March 1. I don't really like trials. I like things organized, but there we are, we had a trial. And based on the evidence, the court determined that Sharon was not in fact related to Peter. She was not his heir and she did not take. And so these 22 beneficiaries took. So that right there, stop right there, that's enough to make me tell everyone, please plan, because you have no idea what could happen with your estate. So the things that we're gonna talk about in terms of elements of an estate plan are the will, a living trust, and we're gonna talk about accounts, beneficiary designation on accounts, jointly owned accounts. We'll talk about a power of attorney and an advanced medical directive. So a will, most people are familiar with the will. It's a legal document. And in the will, you name an executor to carry out your wishes and you list your wishes and your wishes about how to distribute your assets upon your death. And in your will, you have articles and in articles cover various different things. So the first article would name your family. So if we were going to be dealing, talking about my will, then my family would be my husband, who's also an attorney. He's a litigator. Uh, he likes conflict. I like everybody to get along. So when your family is selling your estate, you want that family member to be in my office, not in his. We want a nice, simple settlement where everyone gets along. Also in a will, you can have a bequest. And a bequest is when you leave a certain dollar amount to a certain person or a certain item to a certain person. And we'll talk about bequests in a minute. And so in my will, I have a bequest and then everything else will go to my spouse, my husband, if he survives. And if he doesn't, then I want my assets to go to my husband's two children, my stepdaughters. And I can decide if that division would be equally distributed or if I'm gonna pay it out over time. Um, let's talk a little bit more about bequests. So in my will, my cousin Vicki is going to get $10,000. And so I say $10,000 to my cousin per stirpes. I can always tell if my clients have read the drafts that I presented to them if they ask me, what does per stripes mean? So per stirpes is a Latin term and it means by the roots, by the blood. So this line right here is shorthand. It says $10,000 to my cousin if she survives. And if not, then an equal shares to her children. So my cousin has five children. If she dies before I do, each of her children will get $2,000. One of my clients owns Norman Rockwell paintings that hang in the White House. And in his will, he has a bequest that says his paintings by Norman Rockwell will go to his son if his son survives him. So he has a condition, the son must survive him. Another type of a bequest could be to a nonprofit. So one of my, uh, Clients is interested in eagles and hawks that are in Outer Banks. And in her will, she leaves $25,000 to Island Rescue to purchase a cage for Raptor Rescue. Another element in a will is a trust. And I wanna spend some time talking about a, these trusts. They're called testamentary trusts because they're created after you die. So here's a typical example. If my grandson is under the age of 25 when I die, I give $300,000 to my trustee to hold for his benefit. My trustee has to use the money for his education. And when he turns 25, he can have whatever's left for him. So why, uh, so again, a testamentary trust is created after you die and only if certain conditions are met. So it's always gonna be benefiting someone else. And this is a great tool to uh, give money to someone who's either a minor or maybe someone who needs a little help managing funds or someone who has uh, special needs. Um, in this situation, I'm talking about $300,000 to my grandson who happens to be named Connor, he's 12 years old. And imagine a situation though, where Connor's parents pass away and they're leaving all of their funds to Connor and that's gonna be much more than $300,000.
there's no way we want a 25 year old boy to get that much money all at once. And so the testamentary trust in their will would be a little bit different. It would say, I want everything to go into trust for my son, Connor. And while it's in trust, it can be used for a variety of things, education, health, maintenance, support. And when he's 25, let's give him a little bit. A tier, this is called a tiered distribution. When he's 30, let's give him a little bit more. And then when he's 35, we'll terminate the trust. But at 25, we don't want a young boy to get a lot of funds. So that's a different way to use a testamentary trust for a minor. We also use testamentary trusts for people who have, who have problems managing funds. I've got a client named Lydia and she passed away uh, about two years ago. And she has two sons and each of them have some issues. They're both in their 50s. And she said, Kim, I'd like you to be my trustee and manage funds for their benefit, but I don't want them ever to get the money because they can't manage it and they have some issues. Son number one has some issues with addiction. So the terms in his trust are that he should always have a roof over his head. And if he has some expenses, I should help, I should give him funds for the expenses, but only on a monthly basis. So I keep in touch with son number one, and I always have rent in his account, one, but on a monthly basis. I don't give him a large sum, just one month at a time. And if he has a special need, something comes up, he'll give me a call and I'll put money in his account for those things. Son number two has a different set of issues. Unfortunately, he's had some issues with the law. And when I met with Lydia, he, he, he was in jail. Um, so my, my assistance there was to put money in his canteen account. And she told me when he gets out of jail, I wanna make sure that he has transportation his rent paid for and um, you know any other expenses. So he's been out of jail, we bought a truck, I pay for his rent and I will continue to do that. So I work with them, I talk with them each once a month and keep tabs on them. And that is what Lydia wanted to do. When they pass away, the money in that trust are gonna, will go to her charity. Um, and those are that's her choice. Another type of testamentary trust that we do an awful lot of in planning is when people want to take care of their siblings or maybe their parents and they want to during lifetime they've done things to assist them for instance i have a, a client named ann who lives in goodwin house and ann was a career woman and she was not married and didn't have children and she's very passionate about her charities but during lifetime she has assisted her sister her sister has had a different financial situation and has children. And my client, Anne, doesn't want to leave a bequest to her sister because if, if her sister didn't use all the money, then whatever is left in that bequest would go to her sister's beneficiaries, not my client's beneficiaries. So instead, my client is using a testamentary trust and she's putting aside $200,000 and she's asking her banker, a trustee, to serve as trustee and to use the money for those special things that her sister maybe can't afford, like maybe uh, an unusual medical expense, maybe hearing aids or a wheelchair. Um, other things that my client has helped her sister with have been travel expenses. Let's say the girlfriends are going away for the weekend, but her sister couldn't quite afford it, so my client would give her the funds. So those are the sort of things that are written in the testamentary trust for Anne's sister. And then when her sister dies, whatever's left in that trust is gonna to go to Anne's charity. So Anne is able to help her sister and then her money goes to her charity, which is, what, which is who her beneficiary is. Now, what happens when your will matures? Do you know what I mean by that? That means when you pass away, what happens? You're, the person who's named executor takes your original will to the probate office and the executor is appointed executor by the, by the clerk of the court. That's how your executor receives their authority. Now your will directs assets that are in individual name. So all of your individual named assets were, will go through probate. There's a small probate fee and your uh, executor fills and files an inventory, which is a list of all of the assets that you own. 
This inventory is a matter of public record, so anyone can go down to the courthouse and find out what you, what you owned upon your death. Now, some people say probate is something to be avoided at all cost, but the court does provide a service. The court makes sure that the executor follows the wishes in your will, that your debts are paid, and that the proper beneficiaries receive their funds. So the court oversees the executor in making sure that the executor follows your wishes. Also, an important thing, the court makes sure that your will is valid. And so I want to tell you a little story about that. I had a man who came to me and said, I, I'm holding my father's original will, and um, my father recently died. He left me five, he left me 95% and my sister 5% in his will because he was mad at her. And at the funeral, I said to her, you know what, I'll share some of mine with you. Well, about a week later, he gets a letter from her attorney saying, thank you for agreeing to give 50% of your father's estate to your sister. Well, that's not quite what the brother had in mind. He said, I was really thinking maybe 80-20. And so we started working over here on a settlement between the, the two siblings, at, you know, trying to determine just exactly what the promise was that was made at the funeral. And a couple of months went by. So we finally came to a settlement and our, our client, who was the executor, goes down to the courthouse to file the will. And the courthouse says, oh, we already have a will on file. I said, really? What is that? Show us, please. It's one sentence. It says, I give everything I own to my nurse. <laughs> a complete fraud. So uh, the court, that it was quickly determined that that first will was not valid. Um, everything got sorted out. The nurse is now in jail. She actually had put the real estate up for sale, but no sale had gone, gone through yet. Anyway, so that's uh, one one time when probate really did what it should, making sure the, val the will is valid. Now, if you don't have a will, you still have to go through probate. Your assets that are an individual name have to go through that process. Um, you, may, you will not be able to select who your executor is, so you lose that control. And also, the state will dictate who your beneficiaries are. We already talked about that. Another document that is used in estate planning is called a living trust. You've probably heard about a living trust. And I wanna talk about, earlier we said, we talked about a testamentary trust, and that's a trust that's created after you pass away, if certain conditions are met. But a living trust is a trust that's created now during your lifetime. You create it during your lifetime, and it's, you are the benefit, I'm sorry, you're the beneficiary during your lifetime. So when we talk about a will, a will is not effective until you die. So a living trust is different. It's effective now during lifetime. But it's a document that looks just like a will because you give a set of instructions to a fiduciary. And this time the fiduciary is called a trustee. In the will, the person who carries out your wishes is an executor. But in a trust, the person who carries out your wishes is a trustee. So the trustee follows your wishes and you state what your wishes are during lifetime. And then in the same document, you state what your wishes are upon your death. So this part of the living trust looks just like your will. And the first part is what's different. And so once you create this document by signing it, you now have a separate entity and it actually has a title. So if I were to create a living trust, the title of my trust would be the Kim Fisk Trust, dated March 23rd, 2001, Kim, Kim Fisk as trustee. So that's a separate title. And I can actually move my assets into that trust by changing the title on my assets, changing the title on my accounts, my checking account, my investment account. So when I get my statement, it wouldn't say Kim Fisk anymore. It would say the Kim Fisk Trust dated March 23rd, 2021, Kim Fisk Trustee. And so now I've created a trust and I've retitled my assets into this trust. And I've named myself to serve as trustee during my lifetime. And I name a successor trustee to take over in case I become incapacitated or if I die. And I think that's a really important part about a trust. This is planning for incapacitation. So that I think that's what Goodwin House at Home is all about, planning for incapacitation. This is for financial incapacitation. 
So if you become incapacitated, your successor trustee during your lifetime can take over and manage those assets that are titled in the name of your trust. And then when you pass away, the successor trustee will distribute those assets to the beneficiaries you name in your trust, very similarly to what we discussed in, in a will. Now, assets, as we said before, assets and individual name are those that go through probate. If you create the trust and the assets are in the name of the trust, they don't go through probate. So that's how assets in a trust avoid probate because they're titled differently. They're titled in the name of the trust. So that's what's all that's what's about. <laughs> um, and since those assets in the trust don't go through probate, they're private. There's no inventory that's filed. So no one can go down to the courthouse to find out what you owned. It's a private distribution of your estate. I think a lot of public figures, people who are prominent in the community, they use a living trust as their estate document for privacy. It's very important. So now in the few minutes that I have left, I wanna talk about ownership of assets. We've talked about the documents in an estate plan, but the way the assets that you own are titled are very important to your estate plan. So transferring your assets, it's all about ownership. Property passes four ways upon your debt. They pass, a, they pass by will, and those are your assets that are an in individual name. They pass by trust, and those are the assets that are in the name of your trust. They also pass by contract or operation of law. Assets that pass by contract are those that have a beneficiary form like your life insurance and your IRA and your annuities, all of those have a beneficiary form. It doesn't matter what your will or your trust says, that beneficiary form is how those assets pass. So in my estate plan, my primary beneficiary will be my husband, but I want, if, if he survives, if he doesn't survive, then I would like my assets that pass by beneficiary form to go back into my will or my living trust to pass all together in, in one uh, plan. So I would name my secondary beneficiary, if my husband doesn't survive, I would name either my will, if I had a will, or if I had a trust, I would name my trust. And that's how you tie your document and your assets that have a that pass by contract together. Um, then, we have, then the final thing I wanna talk about is assets that pass by operation of law, and those are joint accounts. And joint accounts, you can have two different kinds. One, either joint with rise survivorship. And what that means is if one of the account owners passes away, then the surviving account owner owns the, is the sole owner of the account. So if I had a joint account with my husband and he passed away, I'm the sole owner of that asset. And so it didn't, it didn't matter what his will said or his trust because it was by operation of law that I received that account. There's also joint tenants without survivorship, and that's a little bit different. Um, that means if one owner, in the example of my husband, if he were to pass away, whatever his percentage of that account is, then that would pass according to what his will said. It wouldn't pass to me automatically because it's not with right of survivorship. So you should check your joint accounts to see how they are listed. Are they with survivorship or without? And again, that's an important part of your plan in determining how your assets will pass to your beneficiaries. So um, in my slides, which you will see, I also talk about a power of attorney, and that's a document that's effective during your lifetime. And you name an agent who will serve excuse me, who will do things on your behalf. And they, your agent can do things like sign your tax return and talk with your insurance agent and enter your safe deposit box. And so it's important to have a power of attorney. And an advanced medical directive is very important to have as well. There's a very wonderful website called connectvirginia.org. And on this website, you can find samples of uh, advanced medical directives. You can download them, you can make some changes, you can sign them and put them into effect. So I recommend that you look at the connectvirginia.org. I think my time is up. 
So thank you very much. Oh, wow. Thank you, Kim. Uh, so much information, wonderful examples of why we need to plan and all that we should, should consider when we're planning. Uh, definitely thought provoking and very thorough explanation. So thank you so much. Uh, up next, we have uh, Mark Williams. Uh, Mark is a technology expert who currently works for the Lansdale Group. Mark consults with Goodwin House on projects designed to implement and manage complex digital platforms that support the entire organization. With several years of experience working in a wide range of set a wide range of settings and situations, Mark will provide tips on how you can keep your digital documents safe and secure. Mark? Thanks so much, Beth. Can you hear me okay? Yes, thank you. All right, thank you. Yeah, so I'm happy to be here today. Happy to talk to you about some ideas around how to organize your information online and share some ideas for storing and sharing that information in the cloud. But one of the first questions people often ask when they start talking about this is, what, what do you mean by the cloud? What is the cloud again? I'm not quite sure I understand what all that means. Storing things in the cloud simply just means taking data that's important to you that you might have on your computer, files, maybe documents, PDFs, photographs, and advanced directive, as Kim was just talking about, maybe some of the legal documents Kim was talking about, storing that information with a service provider on the internet. The advantage of this is a lot of times that can be safer than storing everything just on your local computer. Problems happen with computers, right? You might spill something on it, maybe a hard drive crash. This actually happened to me maybe six or eight months ago. I had a lot of stuff on a backup drive. I was smart enough to think about a backup drive and I had a separate physical drive in my office that my stuff was backed up on. One afternoon, I turned my machine off and I picked up that drive to move it and I heard something clunk in it. I thought, oh no. And sure enough, that drive just bit the dust, it was ruined. So fortunately, I had the stuff, photos, pictures of my kids, I had all that stuff stored out on the internet in the cloud with a service provider and I was able to get another copy of it back. So it's advantage in, in being a little safer maybe than just keeping everything on one computer in your house. Also, this makes it a lot easier to share these important documents, information with family members, with maybe legal advisors, other people that you might need to share information with. So there's a lot of advantages to kind of keeping track of that information online. But, but what kind of information would we be talking about in this case? Well, as I said, maybe an advanced directive, maybe a last wishes, maybe a will, copies of these documents that you might have, maybe your attorney has a copy of them, but but you can keep a copy of them as well as things like insurance policies, maybe investment accounts, really a, a great place to store notes or instructions. So you might write out a set of instructions about where things are. Where do I keep the titles for my cards? Where do I keep my birth certificates? Yeah, some of those documents obviously are critical to have the actual physical copy. But how are your kids or your family or other people going to know where to find those physical documents unless you've documented it somewhere? So typing some of that information up into a, into a document, a Word document or something and storing it on the cloud where you could then share it with your kids, with your legal team, with whoever, that makes it a lot easier for them to know, oh, I can look at this set of instructions and understand and remember, okay, this is where she keeps her titles to the car and this is where I might find documents about the investment account she has. Some of those documents you might actually store copies of photographs or scanned copies of some of those documents that you might just store directly online as well. So what about where we would do that? Where would we store those kinds of things? Well, there's really two big players in the cloud storage arena these days. One is Google Drive, and the other is Microsoft OneDrive. They're both almost exactly on par with each other. Very, very similar functionality, very, very similar features. As you can see, I've kind of documented here some of the slight differences, for example, Google Drive for free comes with 15 GB or gigabytes, that stands for. Just how much can you store on there for free? 15 gigabytes, quite a lot. On Microsoft OneDrive, a little bit less, five gigabytes for free, but still even five gigabytes is a huge amount of space. You can store all kinds of stuff up there. Google Drive, you use a Gmail address. 
address. So if you have a, you know, a Gmail address at gmail.com, then you effectively already have access to Google Drive, whether you've used it or not. Similar thing with Microsoft. If you have an Outlook account, outlook.com or hotmail.com or live.com, Microsoft offers three different domains for emails like that, then you have a OneDrive account already. These platforms are very secure. Security and file sharing, document sharing is built into them. Uh, there are Android and iPhone apps for both of these tools. So regardless of which kind of phone you have, it works fine if you want to access some of those or maybe take pictures with your phone and upload them to both of these platforms. That's very easy to do. It's also very inexpensive to add space to these platforms. So for Google, for example, it's very inexpensive to just add on additional storage space if you find somehow that that 15 gigs is not enough. Microsoft, if you use things like Word and Outlook, Excel, you already have more space with a with an Office subscription. And Microsoft also has a very interesting platform now they just released called the Personal Vault, which is all the features you go to OneDrive, but even more secure. So how hard is this to do? Is this a difficult, hard thing to do, or is this pretty easy? Well, it's actually pretty easy to take these documents and store them online. If you've got some documents you've typed in or maybe things you've scanned in or taken pictures of, or maybe it's just photographs you wanna upload, all you really need to do with either one of these platforms is to create a folder. You know, you go onto your browser and you go to OneDrive or Google Drive, whichever, and you create a folder to call maybe personal documents or important key files, whatever you wanna call it. And then you upload all of your documents that you care to share into that folder. It's easy to have one folder just dedicated to sharing with family and you know, your legal team, financial advisor, and other folders are totally private that no one can access but you. And once you've got those important documents saved into that folder, you share that folder with whoever you want. And all you really need to do that is an email address. If you have their email address, it's easy to share that folder with your son, your daughter, your lawyer, your financial advisor, whoever you need to share that with. And then they have quick, easy access to that information right away from wherever and whenever you need it. So if you become incapacitated or you have a problem or you pass away, your, your family, your legal team can easily find those important documents and look up all those facts we just talked about. <clears throat> what about what about security and passwords? So these things are very secure, both of these platforms. They, they employ what's called data encryption in transit and at rest. That just means while you're uploading files to either of these platforms, that data is encrypted. So people, you know, hackers can't sniff that data off the internet while it's in transit and do anything with it. And the same thing when it's stored at rest. When once the file makes it to Google Drive or to OneDrive, it's stored in an encrypted state. So without access, without the password, no one can access that information. It's very secure that way. You control who has access and what kind of access, whether you want to allow your son and daughter or whatnot to have read access or edit access so they can change the information. You control that yourself. Um, of course, it's always best to be a little more sensitive about things like social security numbers, tax IDs, account numbers. Maybe you want to be a little more cautious about uploading or storing those specific kinds of numbers, but it's a terrific place to store instructions and guides about where things are and all kinds of photographs or scan documents, things like that. And like I said, this Microsoft personal ball thing is a new feature they've got that requires two-factor authentication, meaning you have to have a cell phone and when you try and open it, it will text you or ping your cell phone with some notice that says, hey, someone's trying to access your personal vault. Is that okay? And you can approve that or not. Now, the other thing with passwords is obviously passwords can be very difficult to remember and keep track of. If you're struggling with that, if you're having a hard time with passwords, I would recommend one of these two tools, LastPass or 1Password. These are both great tools that they basically keep track of all your passwords for you. You just need to remember one password to get into either of these tools. And then when you log in with your browser, your browser knows you have that password and the tool just automatically logs you into whatever site you're going to. So those, if you're struggling with passwords, I would recommend trying one of those two tools. Just a couple other things I wanna share with you before we run out of time. Um, as Kim mentioned, there's some great resources out there online for tracking down and keeping track of things like advanced directives and understanding how to do that. 
There is a National Healthcare Decisions Day coming up in a few weeks on April 16th. There's a link here to the conversationproject.org. It's a great place to look around and understand what is this conversation about advanced care directives and how do you have that conversation? What are the documents you might need? There's a website called mydirectives.com that's a very, very powerful, robust platform that keeps track of the exact, it'll ask you the exact questions you need to fill out to, fill, to complete an advanced directive. It will store that information. You can upload other important medical documents there. And the great thing about mydirectives.com is you can allow medical teams to have direct access to that information. So if you get in an accident or something goes wrong or you're not able to speak or whatnot, the medical team can go right onto my directives and they can, with you know permissions, they can access your directive and understand what your wishes are. Another website there, fivewishes.org, is another great tool. They have partnerships with my directives to handle these advanced care directives. And then finally, the My Living Voice is another tool out there. So there's four different tools out there to at least look at and understand what are some of the ways to get involved with an advanced directive and how to store some of that. And finally, the last thing I want to leave you with, there's a YouTube link at the bottom there. It's a terrific, maybe 10, 12 minute video of a TEDx talk from uh, Dr. Elizabeth Claiborne that specifically lays out why this concept of an advanced directive is so important, how it can impact you and your loved ones and the medical teams that may care for you. So it's a great re resource, a great short little video to watch. I would recommend watching that video and then exploring some of these other ways to store information about your health and your medical care online. And I think that's all I have to share with you today. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Mark. I am definitely including uh, getting rid of those files for spring cleaning and going to the cloud. So thank you for your expertise and sharing tips on how we can make that uh, transition and keeping our documents safe. You bet. Thank you. Well, next, we have Seal Garrett, uh, who will discuss the village movement and how these organizations assist their members to remain as safe as they can in their home. Uh, Seal has been the executive director for At Home in Alexandria, or affectionately AHA, since uh, 2013. She also serves as a board officer for the Washington Area Village Exchange, uh, or WAVE, as a consortium of more than 60 villages in the D.C. metro area. Uh, as a member-driven nonprofit, AHA brings together 220 members and 60 volunteers to share activities, programs, services, and emotional support as they navigate aging. Seal, thank you. Thank you, Beth. Um, and thank you, Sarah, both of you for uh, inviting me to be part of this panel. And I, I learn so much every time I, I take part in, in a talk like this from, from Kim and from Mark. Uh, I My talk will be brief. So I don't have a formal presentation. I'm sorry you're just staring at my face and no slides, but um, it's a very it's just a general talk. And I, um, you know, as I as I was listening to Kim and to Mark and and realizing that all of this fits into our desire to to plan whether it's now a year or two down the road or 20 or 30 years down the road, we're trying to make decisions that will give us a quality of life. Uh, and and help us to remain independent and basically do things on our own terms. So my part here is to talk about a community resource <clears throat> that's available to you now, and that is being part of a village. So um, as uh, Beth mentioned, my job is a director of a village in, in uh, Alexandria called at home in Alexandria, and we serve the city of Alexandria residents. But turns out um, we're part of a big group of villages all across the region. And I am part of a regional consortium called, and it is a mouthful, the Washington Area Village Exchange. So we call ourselves WAVE for short, it's a lot easier. But there are more village organizations in the Washington DC metro area than there are at any other place in the country. It's a really popular model here. And that's because so many folks who have lived and worked in the DC area, I mean, it's such a great area to live in that they decide they wanna remain here. And many folks live apart from their families and they don't have, you know, 
uh, family members to help out. That we're all, that's the nature of the way we live now. We're all spread out a bit. So what's a village? Uh, basically, it, a village is a locally formed, usually on a grassroots level, a locally formed nonprofit member-based organization that um, usually formed by people who want to make their community a, a great place to live for us as we're aging. And, you know, we're all aging, every one of us. Um, in one phase or another, we're either aging or we're not, and we know what that means. But the village movement is there to be kind of a backup, a support unit for, for us as we age. So here's how it works. You pay an annual membership fee to join, to be part of a village in your community. And in exchange for that one-time annual fee, you are entitled to call your village and um, arrange to have a, a really an array of non-medical practical support. And that can be transportation, errand running, grocery shopping and delivery, in-home support. And what I mean by that is if you need heavy furniture moved around or you need boxes taken out of the attic or maybe there's you know a 12 foot ceiling like there is in Old Town, many townhomes have these high ceilings and you really don't need to be climbing the ladder to replace that light bulb. Those are the sorts of things that we encourage our members to call us to have a volunteer come out to do for you, to keep you safe and keep it. We always jokingly say that our tagline should be, don't climb the ladder because it kind of, it says it all really. But essentially it's a community. So we do talk a lot about the practical support that you get uh, being part of a village. And as I mentioned, um, we have volunteers who are trained and vetted who offer this, support and they're doing it because they really like to do it they many times what i hear from a volunteer who comes to aha for the first time they say you know my parents have passed away i didn't live close to them i couldn't be there it was my sister who really had the the um a lot of the responsibility fell to her and i I'm able to do this now for someone here in my community, you know, what I couldn't do for my parents or so, something like that. We all have a story of when our own parents were aging and and how maybe they had a, a support. Maybe they were in a small town that, uh, you know, where their community just wrapped their arms around um, those folks. Well, that's basically what a village does. It's a support unit for, uh, for uh, we call ourselves really like, um, it, it's really like a family. We have a village of, uh, as, as Beth mentioned, 220 members and plus a lot of volunteers who really love what they do and volunteers and members become friends. Sometimes volunteers join as members themselves, but it's really a lovely community and when our founders of our village, and this has been largely the case as I hear with other villages in DC, and, and by the way, I should mention that you know there are I think 16 villages now in Virginia, and DC has 17 villages, and right now um, Maryland takes the cake with 40 different villages. So we do have a really uh, strong unit and we all a lot of the villages talk to one another we share programs we learn from one another when we have villages that are in development we will mentor them and help them get started just like Mount Vernon at home was a village that helped us get off the ground and we in turn helped uh, Arlington neighborhood village when they um, started up three years after we had formed so it's a real collegial group and uh, I think just a very talented group of people who really are devoted to creating a better environment for all of us as we age so we can remain here in this city and in the community in the communities that we love but aside from the practical support it's the social support that really is the strength of the village yes the practical support is very very important we we all need rides to the doctors perhaps uh uh Aaron running but it's it's those social gatherings, whether they're a larger you know educational event like this one today, or a coffee and conversation event with you know 
12 people or a book group with 16 people or a current events discussion group with 25 people, an art talk with 35 people. Most villages have a very robust uh, social calendar and they are very social groups. And every village is a little different. The personality uh, is made up of, you know, whatever that community is like. But one thing we share in common is that we really support one another. And it is it is a great group where you can talk with people who are you know, navigating aging, navigating aging, just as you are, as we all are. And we share ideas, we support one another. And it's that social support. It's that social connection, that engagement that really keeps us going. And boy, did we learn that more than ever this past year. So that in a thumbnail, that's what a village is all about. Uh, I have a handout that we can send you after the workshop that will outline. Um, it's, it's a listing of all the villages in the Washington, D.C. area, uh, along with a link to their website. So you can learn if you have a friend maybe in Chevy Chase or uh, any any neighborhood, you can check and see if there is a village in your area or in your friend's uh, area that they could join. But that, in a nutshell, is what a village is all about. Thank you. Thank you so much, Seal, and, and great information. And we definitely value the support that the village can provide. Also, big thank you to Kim and to Mark as well for sharing their expertise and information. So uh, just a reminder, we are gonna open it up for question and answers at this time, but we would like to remind everyone that the best way to make sure we are able to answer your question is to submit it through uh, the feature on the right-hand side. There's a question mark. If you click on that question mark, a box will pop up and you can input your question in that area. And then uh, Katie Ramos will make sure that we um, are able to access that information. So we are open and ready to, to answer any questions you may have about the information that was presented. Thank you so much, Sarah. And thank you to all of our wonderful presenters today. We do have some questions that came through throughout your presentations. So let's start here with the question from Mr. Um, Robert. This question is from Robert. What are typical hourly payments for a family member who is designated executor? So Kim, can you take that question? So the question is, what is the hourly payment? Yes. So an executor's fee is actually based on the size of the estate, the assets that pass through probate. And the fee, as I said, it's based on the size of the estate and it's a sliding scale. So it starts at, I don't have it exactly memorized, but it's 5% um, of the first 500,000, I believe. So one-time fee. Um, and then I think it's 4% of the next 500,000 and 3% of the next maybe 200,000. It's set by the uh, Supreme Court of Virginia. So that's what the executor's fee is. His question might be, what would an attorney charge to assist the executor with settlement of the estate? Um, and that would depend on the attorney. So my particular uh, hourly rate is 375. Um, some people might charge more, some might charge less, but I charge just by the hour for the work that I do. I don't charge based on the assets that go through, estate, through the through probate. Thank you so much, Kim. The next question we have is for Mark. And that question is, is there a checklist of all potential items that should be documented on one's list? Everything from will, bank and investment accounts, names of insurance policies and the values, points of contact for all of these, et cetera. I don't I don't have a, a complete list, but I have seen a couple of good lists online. I could put together a couple of links that would just identify a, a big set of those things. All the things you just mentioned in that question were really good things to have on that list. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you so much, Mark. And to the audience, we can definitely send that out when we send out the recording and other resources we'll be sending out. Um, the flyer from SEAL with the villages in the area, so we can get that to everyone who registered. Another question we have is, 
what is typical annual payment for a village membership? Seal, can you answer that for us? <clears throat> sure. Um, it really ranges. I'm going to say most villages have a two tiered program. One is for people who need full, a full, the full array of services, a practical support. And there's often a social membership, which is different and it's less costly um, because you don't need the practical support yet, but you still want to be part of the group and you want to enjoy the social benefits. For our village, um, an individual would pay $600 per year. Uh, for a household, say a couple or two sisters living together or a mother or daughter or something, it would be 850 annually. For our social membership, it would be $300 a year, and most of that's tax deductible. And for a couple, it would be 350 We are very similar in, uh, in price to many villages. Some are all volunteer. They don't have any staff at all, and they are operating, you know, out of a free uh, office space in a church or something, they're able to have lower annual costs. So we are probably on the higher end, to be honest, um, but that's, that's basically the range. Thank you, Seal. This is a great question for Sarah or Beth as it relates to Goodwin House at Home. How does a village interface or substitute for Goodwin House at Home? Beth? <laughs> so we, we definitely work very closely with the villages. Um, I, I think because we both have um, individual services that we provide, individual plans, um, there's no, um, I wouldn't say that we have any, um, the overlap so much, um, but we do work very closely with the village uh, program. I think just to add on to what Beth was saying is um, we, Goodwin House at Home, believe so strongly in what the villages provide in terms of how both programs can complement each other is that we actually pay a portion of the membership fee on behalf of our members who are interested in joining the village in their local area. So we do have really good partnerships and really value those partnerships with the village programs. We jokingly say we're the farm team for Goodwin House and Goodwin House at Home. You know, we offer the non-medical support and maybe often folks will end up more fully using the benefits that Goodwin House and Goodwin House at Home provides. Thank you so much. We have another question for Kim. If you have a living will, then you do not have to do a will, right? That's a good question. I get that asked a lot. I think the question is, if you have a living trust, you won't need a will. And so, as I said, the will transfers assets that are in individual name and the trust transfers assets that are titled in the name of your trust. So when you have a trust, you should also have a will because there may be assets that you accidentally forget to transfer to the name of your will, uh, trust. And so we want to make sure that those assets uh, end up in the trust. So the will is a very short will and it says if there's anything I forgot to transfer into the name of my trust, please transfer that into my trust and have it distributed according to my trust. And sometimes people think they get all of their assets in the trust and they keep saying I don't and they tell me I don't need the will, but sometimes there are things like refunds. So if you've made a deposit like a large deposit maybe on a, um, a, a retirement home, um, and you pass away before you actually move in, then that refund is gonna be an individual name. So you really would need a will for that. Thank you so much, Kim. And as we are coming to an end with our time together, we'll take one more question. And that question is also for Kim. I have a trust in my name. Should my checking account now have my name on it, followed by the word trust? So uh, if the checking account is in the name of your trust, when you have your name on it, you should be identified as trustee. So when you sign a check, you should sign your name, comma, trustee. 
And so the title would be name of trust, and then the second line would be your name, comma, trustee. Thank you so much, Kim. And thank you to our wonderful presenters and answering the great, great questions that were submitted today. <laughs> Yes, thank you so much. Um, this has been a great event and I hope um, everybody has enjoyed the presentations. Um, we will, if, if you submitted your questions on the right-hand side of the screen using the chat box, we will get a list, a list of those questions that we were unable to answer and we will put together uh, response sheets uh, to those questions and email them out. So, and as Katie mentioned, we will be sending uh, in, by email a copy of the recording, uh, a copy of the uh, presentations, and then also um, the material that uh, SEAL is providing. And um, if Mark has any resources, we'll, we'll provide that as well. So we'll we'll get information out to you via email. Um, so again, thank you so much for joining us. This is last page, uh, Goodwin House at Home, if you're interested in learning more, has an upcoming, upcoming informational webinar on April 14th at one o'clock. Um, you can register either online um, through the Goodwin House website, um, or we will be sending out um, invitations in the next uh, week or so to this event. So. Again, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we really value the fact that you've taken time to be with us today. And we hope to uh, speak with you or see you actually in person soon. Thanks so much.